When you're talking to your students and you see a student come into your studio, maybe it's the first time that you work with them, mm -hmm. and you just see what they're doing, what are the things that you're looking for in getting them set up and ready to play? Well, probably the most important thing is posture. Um, the, uh, you see so many different things for, um, for horn players, mostly because band directors often put the chairs too close together, uh -huh. um, and horn players are forced to... Um, to squeeze the horn in, and, the, and then you see this. Of course, that just cuts off the air and sure. all that kind of stuff, and it upsets the balance and everything like that. So, um, uh, posture. I believe um, your feet should be flat on the floor, and uh, that the horn, the the pipe of the horn should be um, parallel to your sternum, hmm. mm -hmm. and, sh and should be actually in the center of your body, and the whole horn goes off to the right. Mm -hmm. um, that that gets your um, your shoulders in the right place. Yeah. Um, that's probably the biggest, uh, the biggest problem I see of people coming in um, who, who don't have good posture. And so I always make sure when there's a young student or someone that I really reinforce that. Right. Um, as far as putting the horn to your face, the, um, the horn should be at a, a, a slightly downward angle, um, maybe, I don't know, maybe 45 degrees or something like that um, down from center. Um, you want your your head to be um, not up, but just kind of as as you normally would be talking to someone. Mm -hmm. People wonder what to do with their with the bell, of course, because it's the French horn. And a lot of people put the put the bell on the leg. Um, uh, some people don't. It doesn't really matter if you don't. Then you're holding the horn up. If you do put on the leg, you, your leg is a, a, something that can move around. So a lot of sure. times, getting getting the kids to put the horn. Here they actually have to move their leg, and that's usually not a very big deal. They just have to learn a different place to put their leg, right. put the horn down. Right. I noticed when when you were holding the horn, just demonstrating where it needs to be in relationship to your embouchure. Mm -hmm. Your horn was up. I mean, the bell wasn't anywhere close to a leg. Right. So, for for smaller kids who are doing that, would you tell me how you get them to use their leg to balance the bell if they're going to do that? Well, um, uh, for smaller kids. Uh, Oh, well, they'll just put their, they, they can move their leg wherever they want. So you, mm -hmm. you bring the horn to your, your face wherever, wherever you want the face. And this, this can move slightly, mm -hmm. um, the angle here, and then you can bring your leg over to find the right place mm -hmm. where it's in. Um, for a, a lot of small kids, it's, it's um, actually um, more important that they, a lot of them try to put their hand in the bell, which is something that, you know, horn players do, and, and it sort of makes our sound so characteristic. Um, but they, but the, they're too small to actually do that, and too small, you know, to, to so um, I tell little kids to hold the horn like this, and and um, so that it feels right, because as they grow into it, they can put their hand in. And I had a teacher once who told me that if if you can make a, if you have a good ear and you can make a good sound as a French horn player with your hand out of the bell, it's just going to be that much more beautiful when you finally put huh. it in the bell. So so they, they the, 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 I don't believe really believe that that's a, a deterrent or anything. You don't have to put it in right away, I guess. Huh. So, so when you were doing that before, as you were with a small kid, you, you had sort of the palm of your hand against the bell and were holding it up that way, Just yeah? Just like that. That's uh -huh. how I played when I was... Um, I've actually had students who were very, very small where we, where we, um, we put a, um, a piano or yeah, whatever, yeah. and they just rested the horn because they, they couldn't, they just couldn't get it. I think, I think the balance and the centering and all this stuff is probably the most important thing. Yeah. Because if they start practicing with their head crooked or something like that, it's going to lead to problems down the line mm -hmm. the more they go. And I was noticing, Pat, just as, as, as we're talking here, when you were moving to just a resting position like you are now, mm -hmm. to picking up the horn game, getting ready to play, there was very little in your body that changed. I mean, you seem in a relaxed position now. The horn came up. You seemed in the same relaxed position. I didn't see your right. position. Yeah, I totally, I, I totally believe that so much that um, it's um, changing completely to, to play the horn is, is just um, it's just not natural. I think I mean there's so many things that are unnatural about blowing through a piece of metal that mm -hmm. but I think that trying to keep it like you're sitting at dinner eating dinner you know it's like you wouldn't I tell students this you wouldn't sit at a table and put your plate and your fork and your spoon and your cup over here, mm -hmm. and you you can totally eat from that position, but it's in, it's inconvenient. Why not bring it all right where, right in front of you, makes yeah. much more sense. And why not sit like you're sitting at dinner? Why mm -hmm. why why are you just like this? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, se several of our colleagues have mentioned, um, you know, in in an effort to get people to have good posture, mm -hmm. you know, and sitting up. Mm -hmm. uh, 
it, it seems like what gets interpreted by students often is overdoing all of mm -hmm. that. Yeah. You know, and you seem to be emphasizing you're not making much change in your comfortable sitting position from going to the right. more. The less tension, the better, the yeah. better. And this introduces too much tension. And actually, I feel, and I think that the, the camps are divided on this, but um, uh, I believe that I can take a better a better breath when I'm sitting down with my pelvis, rolled roll back on my pelvis, uh -huh. than I can if I'm up like this. Uh -huh. And I feel like I can actually take a better breath sitting down than I can when I'm standing up. The, the, breath, the breath actually goes deeper, and huh. so, so I think that being more relaxed um, is the way to go. Yeah. So you, you mentioned t taking a, a breath now. So when you're, again, when you're observing students or you're introducing this idea to students about breathing and playing the horn, how, how do you discuss that with them? What, what do you say to them about that? My favorite um, image for taking air in is um, I, want, I want the whole, the whole circle to expand, not just my stomach. Mm -hmm. And so um, um, I feel like when I take a breath that the um, sort of like a balloon that's um, hooked up to a water tap mm -hmm. and you know you turn the water and it just goes whoosh, you know I think we all know what a wa what a water balloon does when you fill it up it yeah. goes like this and so when I take the breath it, it brings me down mm -hmm. um, and and makes me fat and mm -hmm. so like that and then mm -hmm. the tension is all down far far down as far down away from my lungs and my face and my neck as possible. Yeah. And that's where I carry the, the, mm -hmm. the onus of the tension, I guess. Mm -hmm. So that's that's my best one. And I really believe that you, you should focus on expanding the back in addition, or as well as the front, because it goes all the way around. The lungs aren't just in the front of your body. Mm -hmm. You know, I noticed again, even when you took that quick breath that you did, which I'm going to ask you to do again, mm -hmm. it, is that, again, how little move, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, there was just very little change in your body position when you right. did that. I mean, the breath was not an obvious right. production. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Could, yeah. You, could you do that one more time? Could you just take that quick breath again? I sort of feel like it pulls me down. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, they it always talk like about don't bit. raise your shoulders. I, I let the shoulders drop. And, and um, I, let the breath, I let the breath relax my upper body. Mm -hmm. The breath should relax your body. It should should rejuvenate your body. It mm -hmm. should create all this extra tension. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about the getting the air out. So getting the air out, it, um, it's all it, it's. Uh, well, I'm not sure. I mean, I have a zillion different things that, that I talk about in terms of, of getting the air out. But it's all about air speed and um, keeping the air speed completely constant. Um, the uh, so many brass players use pressure mm -hmm. to get higher, and um, and they need to rely more on the airspeed to, mm -hmm. to, to keep the, the air going. And and I think about I think about the um, how uh, um, even though you're playing well, if you have to play a slur, for instance, between two notes, mm -hmm. um, like that, and horn players play lots of big slurs. That's one of our characteristic things that we have to do. Um, if you think about what has to happen to go from the low note to the high note, the, the low note has a looser aperture and a slightly slower airspeed than the higher note. Mm -hmm. And so what you have to do to make that slur smoother to get from the low note to the high note, you have to, the, the aperture has to close and the airspeed has to go higher. Mm -hmm. But the truth, I mean, and that is the truth. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but if you focus all just on your lips doing it, you're gonna you're gonna resort to pressure. But the interesting thing about any note on on the horn, I I believe this is true, but uh -huh. I mean, but it's true for me, and so and so. Um, but that I can play uh, an E. The first note I played was an E at 60 miles an hour. That's my wind speed, okay. And uh -huh. then say that the the high C has to be at 100 miles an hour to make a nice, beautiful C. Mm -hmm. And so I have to go from 60 to 100. Well, I can't really play uh, let's see a slower wind speed on that E without getting the E, but I can certainly spin my air faster on the E, so I can spin my air at 100, so that all I have to do to flip from the E to the C is just a quick aperture change, rather than change my aperture and change my wind speed at the same time, hmm. and that makes a smooth, for a smoother slur. Yeah. So, so for me, it's all about keeping the air steady. Do you start with the whole horn? Do you spend some time with the mouthpiece beforehand? I mean, what, what do you do? I would that? spend time with the mouthpiece. I usually do just a week or so, uh -huh. mostly because when I was 
a beginner student and I started the French horn and they told me just to play in the mouthpiece for a week and not play on the horn and boy that horn was sitting in that room just calling out to me you know and I said you know I'm gonna do it anyway and I had the biggest headaches uh -huh. for like two weeks that playing the horn actually was giving me headaches and stuff so it was just it's a very long instrument so uh -huh. it's longer than the trumpet you know mm -hmm. the trombone and, sure. and, um, and so it's a it's a lot to blow so I would recommend hanging out in the mouthpiece for a while. Yeah. And for mouthpiece placement, I just tell them to put it in a comfortable place to say M. Um, and uh, technically, they say the horn mouthpiece should be two-thirds upper lip and one-third lower lip, but I've seen every variation of that. There's a book I call... Chops? No, this is by Phil Farkas. Oh. Um, it's like, it has a, a, a more scholarly name. <laughs> like um, um, 40 pictures of 40 famous virtuoso corn players or something and took, he took pictures of everyone's and then he, he um, concludes that it's two thirds upper and one third lower from these great horn players so it's kind of, it's kind of a gross book to look yeah. at but and, and if Phil Farkas said it so it well that's great. right yeah. but I, I, I you know I kind of it all depends on your teeth and everything but I tell most I tell most kids um, I used to say when I was up in the Midwest just say M and put it there and but when I moved down to New Mexico and taught there I learned to say M Ponada, which is great because <laughs> right where the M and the P meet is the it's halfway between this pucker and halfway between the smile huh. that you need. So M M Ponada right there is is a great place to great way. I didn't learn that because I didn't even know what an empanada yes. was <laughs> until I moved in. And now you eat them. So <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so but I like that. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. So so when, when you have them just on, on, on the mouthpiece, what, what are you having them do? Do oh, kind of the kind of siren stuff that you were doing siren before? Siren stuff. I have them um, play tunes. That's the other thing. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. But I have them play tunes. Come back next week and play Mary Had a Little Lamb. Play Happy Birthday. You know, because they have to figure out how to make it go up and how to make it go down. And, yeah. And, um, so just that kind of stuff. Um, uh, songs they know. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, here I'm getting back to that now, but I that's I'll get back to in a minute. Here it is. That's another thing with horn players. It's so important. Um, every week, little horn players, you have to give them tunes that they recognize. Because um, you can play a whole song and play all the right fingerings and be on the completely wrong partial. And you have no idea, and they have no idea. They think they're playing it right mm -hmm. because they don't have any, you know. And they're pushing the right button, so. Yeah, and the piano is a fifth off, and they don't know, understand transposition, so they can't really go to the piano to to figure that out and stuff. And so, um, so, so I always give you know, Christmas songs or patriotic songs or nursery rhymes or anything like that, and and um, so that they start developing their ear right away, mm -hmm. if, if they, you know, if they have a shaky ear. So I guess can only help. So. Yeah, right, right. The French horn is, you know, unique because you can play so many notes within one octave. Mm -hmm. you can play without moving your finger, you know, any fingers at all like that. And the and a lot of us learn to um, to do that to to play those notes by actually moving our embouchure. Mm -hmm. And you can see. I'll, Go to go to a high school band concert. Yeah. See them all do. I shouldn't say all high school band for the, um, but the the um, the efficient way to do it is to actually um, blow lots of air on the low note so that you already have your wind speed going for the high note when you start that 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 slur, and then instead of um, going to different settings, you play a glissando. So when so when I so it's, I'm essentially playing this. And the horn catches the notes mm -hmm. rather than me placing the notes. And um, I have used absolutely no extra pressure on the high note than I have on the low note. Mm -hmm. And so, and all of those moves from partial to partial feel like a little pop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's, I think that's what I'm talking about. Uh -huh. And when you just did that example right there, did you have any sense that your tongue was changing? Where's your tongue in your mouth when you're doing that? Is it arched? Is it up? Is it down on the floor? Where, where is it? Or do you have no idea? I, I have no, I not, don't really think about it, but um, I remember thinking about it as a young student and I was trying to keep it out of the way. Uh-huh. Ah. Uh -huh. Horn plays ah and oh. You know, we're always using those two vowel sounds mostly. 
the brightest we ever get is the eh, uh, uh -huh. the schwa sound, yeah. I guess they yeah. call it. Um, uh, but, um, uh, you know, just to get the, the dark sound and the, the beautiful sound, because we play, this, there were, our range is so extreme that we're always basically going from an O and an A. Ah. So I, th I, I would imagine that my tongue is down low. When you're articulating on the horn, you, you mentioned a lot about how notes end. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of times when people think about articulation, they're only thinking about the front of the notes and not the back of the notes. So could, could you talk about all of that when you think about the shapes of the notes that you play and how physically you do that? Mm -hmm. I, th I guess I think about the... I, um, I never play the ends of notes. Mm -hmm. I always keep it open. I send mm -hmm. everything out and mm -hmm. forward. Um, never close it off with the tongue. Because um, uh, you can go that short because you, your breath, you know how to go tut because mm -hmm. we, we do when we speak. So mm -hmm. that's a very short, that's going to be a short note. I don't have to go tut mm -hmm. to make it short tut. It's just a short. Um, uh, the, um, I think of the, the tongue um, just a nice single stroke coming forward. I don't think of the tip ever of the tongue. I mm. think of the, the place right behind because that's actually, if you say the word Thomas, that's part that touches your alveolar ridge is the, that's the, the ridge up there is alveolar. Um, t it's there, it's not. T yeah. Um, and uh, I think I never teach tongue in from the tip. I just say say the word Thomas, and I sperm Thomas. And that's how your tongue should go when you when you articulate. And I I, I still I believe that. Hmm. Um, sometimes um, I if it's a particularly very high, um, I might think of the tip. I might flex the tip of the tongue. But I don't really think about where the tip is touching. I don't really care about that. It shouldn't be down between your teeth, of course, way too low. Sure. Um, and uh, anchor tonguing doesn't work on, uh, on the horn very well. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, um, I, I mostly use a T. I rarely use a D. A D, um, I, think, I think I have this right. T, the tongue comes straight back, mm -hmm. and D, the tongue drops. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, trombone and trumpet players can get, trombone and trumpet players can get away with a do tongue uh -huh. um, because uh, their instrument is so much shorter mm -hmm. and their bell's going straight out. I think if a horn player plays a D tongue, it ends up sounding like mwah because our sound has to find something to bounce off of and then cut off. So I don't ever use a D tongue. Hmm. Rarely, I yeah. guess I'll say yeah. rarely. Sometimes when I'm trying to fake something I can't slur, I'll use the D tongue. <laughs> because no one really knows. Yeah. Know, they can't really tell. And sure. So, um, but um, so I mostly use a T mm -hmm. for everything. Mm -hmm. The French horn has, in general, um, has some real sweet spots. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is, I can't say this is true of every horn, but from, for a lot of us um, in the treble clef, in the treble staff or whatever, middle uh, second line G mm -hmm. down to C and then down to that to the G below middle C there mm -hmm. that's a it, the horn just doesn't resonate as well mm -hmm. um, as it does up high and down really down low yeah and 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 for most of us that that's an area of transition and and we don't um, we don't have a great setting for that register we have a nice high setting we have a low setting and and, and because of that it doesn't we don't really have a home base. It's always moving in and through that, through that. Mm -hmm. And um, on a Connie D specifically, that's a, a very dead area. Mm -hmm. um, it just and so you have to do something to kind of liven it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, and that that is more of a vowel sound thing. You slightly change your vowel sound. Mm -hmm. And um, again, it's I think it's different for every person. And sure. I, and I just listen. We do it. I do extras with my students where they play a note that's a really beautiful note, and and to just push the sound down into the next note mm -hmm. and move back, and and not really be aware of what you're doing, but just listen for it. Just mm -hmm. listen for it, and then you go down another half step and bring it back up and go down to to, to learn what the setting might be yeah. for that area. Or I guess there's this big push um, to play faster and higher and. And, and I think a lot of horn players that I see come through my door for auditions and stuff like that um, have great technique, but <clears throat> don't really have a sound at all. Mm -hmm. And that, and that they're, they're pushed to play really hard, hard solos. And 
I guess I think, what's the point if you don't have a beautiful French horn sound? What's mm -hmm. the point of playing? You might as well play it on a, a, a keyboard. Mm -hmm. You know, that it's, it just doesn't... And so I wish people would let horn players play beautiful solos and give them... And judges judge them so that they judge them on their sound and their phrasing rather than the fact that it's not a fast and high. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I noticed that when you're playing across a wide range, mm -hmm. that your your embouchure, the, the mouthpiece actually moves a little bit from side to side. What's what's that about? Well, my teeth are crooked. Uh -huh. My parents couldn't afford to give me braces when I was a kid. <laughs> my brother and my sister got them, and, and I never got them. And so I, I, I think that's just something I learned over the years to compensate for the for what has to happen. And, yeah. And, and to avoid um, hitting the ridges or something when I go up. Uh-huh, uh-huh.